Have you heard the good news? The COVID-19 measures implemented by the government since late February have resulted in a steady decline in the infection and hospitalization rates. Oh yes, our sacrifices are paying off, but we are not yet out of the woods. So we urge you to continue to practice the COVID-19 protocols, washing your hands regularly, using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, wearing a mask while in public, and staying socially distant. Let's all play our part to control the spread of COVID-19. Practice good hygiene by washing your hands frequently using soap and water. Here's how you should do it while conserving water. Turn on the tap to wet your hands, then turn off the pipe. Lather your hands and the tap with soap. Turn on the tap and wash your hands, back, front, and in between fingers. Use some of the water to wash off the tap, then turn it off. Dry your hands with disposable hand towels. If you don't have running water, use a hand rub containing 62% or more alcohol. If hand sanitizers are not available, rubbing alcohol, Dettol, white rum, or household bleach will do the trick. And if all else fails, let hand washing and the handling of potable water be a two-person event. Each person will take turns pouring and washing hands with sitting water. Now is a good time to consider installing a tap on your containers to reduce the risk of water contamination. Faucets can be easily attached to drums, buckets, or five-gallon water bottles. And to ensure that the outside of the containers are clean when recapping, disinfect it with hand rub containing alcohol that's 62% or more. The five R's of water conservation are also necessary to practice. Reduce water wastage by investing in water-saving devices. Reuse water at least twice before discarding. Replace leaking pipes, faucets, and other plumbing equipment. Recycle wastewater and use it for gardening, car washing, or cleaning of public spaces. And reclaim water through rainwater harvesting. We all must play our part to ensure there's water to combat the coronavirus and stave off prolonged drought. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Monday, May 10, 2021. With face-to-face -face classes resuming today for students sitting exit exams, provision is being made for more teachers to be vaccinated. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says that to date, 7,500 teachers have received their first dose and more will be inoculated as part of the infection prevention and control measures. It's a fairly decent number, still not high enough to give us the satisfaction we would need but we do have a critical core that uh, could carry the revision classes and the face-to-face -face, um, classes that we need. He is urging teachers to take the vaccine. In other education news, Portfolio Minister Favel Williams says the ministry is looking to move from the generalist teaching model in primary schools to a specialist system. She was making her contribution to the 2021-2022 sectoral debate in the House of Representatives recently. We will begin the transition of having specialist teachers in our worst performing primary school as identified by the National Education Inspectorate. The minister points out that the present system involves one teacher being responsible for all subject areas at the primary level and says the master teacher concept is among the strategies to increase teacher effectiveness and student learning. We have a small pool of master teachers available to classroom teachers. They can rove virtually now that we have the technology. We need to create the schedule and iron out the logistics. This master teacher concept exists currently but the ministry has been tepid or lukewarm in its implementation. Meanwhile, the Education Ministry will be creating an online repository of lesson plans for teachers. The platform will be easy to use. Lesson plans will be organized by subject and grade level. 
Within his lesson plan, you'll find clear objectives, description of materials needed, a thorough procedure with an opening and a closing, as well as assessments and modifications. The education minister says teachers can download and tailor the lesson plans to fit the needs of their students. In addition, she says that if teachers have lesson plans they think are excellent, they can upload and share them with other educators. We expect that the central repository of lesson plans will promote collaboration among teachers all across the education sector and that by providing this tool for our teachers, it will enable teachers to focus more of their time on the ever-important demands of classroom management and student-teacher relationship. In other news, the health sector has received $3.5 million worth of personal protective equipment, PPEs, to support the work of frontline workers managing the COVID-19 pandemic. The donation was made recently by the Massey Group of Companies. The group also contributed approximately $500,000 to the Seaview Gardens Health Center under the Ministry of Health's Adopt-A-Clinic program. What the Massey Group is demonstrating through this $3.5 million contribution in PPEs, masks and so on, as well as the contribution to the adopt a clinic program, is that they recognize that outside of their core activity, it is in their interest and all our interests to support the greater good of society. And the COVID uh, pandemic, which has affected all of us, um, clearly is a great place to start. The Attorney General's Chambers is looking to establish an integrated library management system which will enable attorneys to have access to the library and database from any location or device. As part of that, Attorney General Marlene Malahu-Fort says the database for the library, which is housed within the Human Resource Management and Administration Division, is being updated. Madam Speaker, in so far as the library is concerned, we're currently engaged in a project to update its database and to add new categories for proclamations, rules and regulations, extraordinary gadgets and judgments from the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal. The Attorney General was making her contribution to the 2021-22 sectoral debate in Parliament recently. She says so far a total of 773 gazettes and 140 judgments have been added to the database. And finally, applications are now open for Jamaicans at home and in the diaspora to submit their drawings for government's low-cost housing design competition. The competition, which was launched on Friday, is aimed at accessing creative, original and resilient low-cost housing designs that will be used to accelerate the national social housing program. What we're trying to do is to get the architectural, the, the planning community, the environmental community to take the vast knowledge that exists both globally and of the local circumstance and infuse it into practice to solve real world problems and then the government would take that application put it through our bureaucracy and then have it implemented submissions will be accepted from individuals and groups of up to five persons the winning design will cop a first place prize of $1 million, while second place is $500,000 and third place gets $250,000. Registration for the low-cost housing design competition ends at 4 p.m. on May 25. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Concerned about uncollected garbage at home? Do you see garbage piling up on the streets? Then report it. Use the National Solid Waste Management Authority's mobile app to report instances of littering, illegal dumping and uncollected garbage. From anywhere and at any time, be an environment warden by informing the authority of unsightly solid waste. You will be notified when your report has been received by the NSWMA as well as when the matter is resolved. Download the app from the iOS or Android app stores by typing in NSWMA. Play your part, as Jamaica's beauty is everybody's duty. They have given significant support in this time to the robust construction sector, which has held up and been one pillar throughout this downturn. For many, owning a piece of the rock is a major life achievement, and government is acutely aware of this goal.
that's why the state has created several entities to give even more Jamaicans greater access to home ownership. One of the agencies leading the charge is the Housing Agency of Jamaica. Our development consists of building housing units, providing service lots, regularizing informal communities. So we cover the entire sphere of housing development. Once the National Housing Development Corporation Limited, the entity has been operating as the Housing Agency of Jamaica HAJ since 2008. Though the focus is primarily on providing affordable housing solutions, the agency has on occasion built housing developments targeting higher income brackets. Why? The HAJ is a self-financing agency of government, so it is responsible for its operational costs. The entity has a proven track record in constructing housing solutions. Among the completed projects are Greater Portmore, Oaklands, College Green, Pines of Karachi, Mona and Portmore Country Club 2. And plans are already in place for other projects to be built across the length and breadth of Jamaica. We have uh, 772 housing solution development working on in Rhine Park, St. James. It's a mix of two bedroom, one bathroom housing units, one bedroom apartments, townhouses, and three bedroom, two bathroom houses. Phase one of the project, which consists of 152 units, went on the market in January 2021. There's also the 1,650-unit Catherine Estates housing development in Bernard Lodge, St. Catherine. Catherine Estates is a development that we are trying our best to see how we can address a, a serious gap in the market. Um, it's, it's a mix of studio units and one bedroom unit, so it's, part, it's what we call starter homes. Because since Greater Portmore, nothing of this nature has been done. Units range between six and seven million dollars. 475 units in phase one will be ready in March 2021. We have Mona, which is under we you know, um, we're doing 50 service lots. That's in between Panzer Karch and Long Mountain. Those 50 service lots um, were priced at market value. The HAJ has also been finalizing other housing projects which are slated to come on stream in the year. Among them, Sandown Crescent and Health Reviews in St. Catherine. Environmental permits have been granted and the Municipal Corporation is now perusing the plans. Sandown Crescent will have 146 townhomes, while the 623 health reviews will be a mix of one, two and three bedroom units. We are pretty much advanced in, another, in planning a development in Saint Luana St. Elizabeth, 250 solutions, mix of service lots and units. We are doing 150 units in St. Anne, Renaud Bay area, St. Anne. And a joint venture agreement is being finalized to deliver 1,200 housing solutions in Montego Bay, St. James. Currently, we are doing a regularization prog program in Grange Pen, St. James. That is an informal settlement in excess of 535 solutions. Um, the work is pretty much halfway there. We have gotten some grant funding from the Tourism Enhancement Fund. The HAJ not only regularizes communities, it also provides land titles for properties that have been regularized. Just recently, 30 households received land titles to properties in Kingston and St. Andrew, as well as Clarendon. We understand the role that we have to play as a ministry in the improving of the lives and livelihood of our people. And certainly land registration um, is identified as a major driver of economic growth, but also um, a very significant benefits flow from having that certificate of title. You will be able to use your title to access loans, to access formal credit. Developers, you're also included in the HAJ's plans. As I said, the partner will be responsible for designing financing and building the project and then we will take on the aspects of project management, marketing, sales, legal, the conveyancing aspects uh, to deliver to the customer. So if you're interested in owning a piece of the rock, 
Visit the HAJ website, hajl.gov.jm, and remember... We are not limited by um, the fact that persons ha have to be contributors to NHT because we recognize that some persons do are self-employed and so not, might not necessarily contribute, but they are able to access a loan from a credit union or an another, in another institution. We facilitate those as well. We want you to spend quality family time with your children, not just this child month, but every day. Here are two child-friendly locations for you to consider for bonding time with your offspring. They offer a large serving of nature with a dash of history and science. Public gardens, created and maintained to educate Jamaicans on the importance of plant life. They also provide free green spaces to enjoy the benefits of the great outdoors. There are four such spaces on the island, all supported by the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries. And after making our way through Bath and trekking through Castleton in the first part of our journey, we're now 4,800 feet above sea level, the Sincona Botanical Gardens, located in the cool, moist hills of East Rural St. Andrew. Sincona was first established in 1868 by the then governor, Sir John Peter Grant. At that time, the gardens was used as an experimental location. Various plants from other European countries were brought here for medicinal purposes, like the eucalyptus, the camphor, and other herbs are grown up here. Sincona is unique as it is the only garden in the Caribbean at such a high elevation. Sincona got its name at the time when there was um, a malaria infestation in the, uh, on the island. And that Sincona plant was brought to Jamaica by a governor of Peru. The Sincona plant was used to cure the malaria by way of extracting the bark of the plant and transforming that into quinine and they use that to work on the malaria. There are no conservation programs at Sincona, but if you're feeling adventurous, make the hike and study an array of exotic plants on location, including the almost 200 year old hoop pine. journey ends at the largest green space in the Kingston metropolitan area. Though run by the non-governmental organization Nature Preservation Foundation, it still receives a subsidy from the government and is free to the public. Hope Gardens comprises of 260 acres stretching from Old Hope Road to Skyline Drive, but the actual gardens is mainly 60 active acres. The garden was a gift to Major Richard Hope, who was part of the contingency of Penn and Velables who came to conquer the island in about 1655 when the English invaded and took over from the Spanish. Hope was an experimental site. 
They introduced exotic plants here and we planted them on the island once successfully propagated. Offspring of these plants remain in the garden. We have the cannonball tree, which is native to the Amazon rainforest, that bears a fruit that takes 18 months to ripe and it also weighs about 15 pounds. We also have the sausage tree, and that fruit can weigh anywhere between 15 to 27 pounds, and it really does look like a huge German sausage. The tree is native to West Africa in Senegal. Hope is vital in the conservation of the island's wildlife and flora. We have a particular project in which we go to the cockpit country and get endemic plants, take them back to Hope Gardens, grow them and reintroduce them into the wild. The zoo also has a world famous iguana project in which they have rediscovered the local Jamaican iguana, bred them successfully in captivity and has, have introduced over 400 native iguanas into the hills of Helsha. This garden is usually bustling with activities. Family gatherings, professional photography, and school excursions are among the popular happenings. The Chinese garden is also a special place within the Hope Gardens. It was a gift, a, a three million US dollar gift from the People's Republic of China to the people and government of Jamaica. I like about Hope Gardens is that you are free. You can do anything you want. You can paint, you can play, you can go to the zoo, like see the animals. My group came here because we have um, a history group project. We thought that coming to the Hope Gardens would be a good idea, especially on a Sunday, because on a Sunday it's quiet and I think it's very conducive to practice. There is um, greenery and it's an open space. So, you know, you get a nice fresh breath of air while you're here and it's, um, I think it helps you to focus more on what you need to do. Hope Gardens is a getaway for persons wanting a break from the hustle and bustle of city life. A visit to public gardens provides this opportunity. Nature beckons. What are you waiting for? As we spend time with our children this child month, we share how to properly sanitize their technological devices. And be sure to stick around for some parenting tips. Android, iOS, non-internet based. It doesn't matter the brand, type, model or cost. Phones need to be periodically cleaned. There are no apps, not yet, that will de-germ the outer surface of these mobile gadgets. And unless you have an ultraviolet UV sanitizer toolkit, you'll have to manually decontaminate the device. Germs are everywhere, and so too are our phones, inside a bag or pocket, on a table or counter, the car, bed, even in our hands. Placing our phones on these surfaces puts them in constant contact with germs, even the novel coronavirus. And according to the World Health Organization, the virus has a lifespan of up to 96 hours on surfaces. That's four full days on plastic or metals, the type of exterior shell of many phones. Constant touching of the phone with naked fingers that we then use to touch our faces, or directly placing the phone to our faces is a recipe for transmitting germs, bacteria, or viruses to the body. First thing I do when I get home is I clean my phone. Because you're touching your phone and you're touching this surface that somebody else just touched, and then you put the phone to your mouth and you're ha 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 ha. And all of these particles that have ended up on the phone, you, they end up on, I mean, in you. Apart from just not using a phone, our only defense is to clean them regularly. Soap and water would be best, but no, you should not submerge your phone in liquid. Instead, first wash your hands with soap and water, then dry them. Ensure that your phone is unplugged to prevent a possible electrical shock. Then, dab a clean cloth, preferably a microfiber or lens cloth, with a 70% isopropyl alcohol solution, and wipe the entire surface of your phone. 
Do not drench the cloth with too much solution, just sufficient to clean the device. In addition, be careful to avoid getting moisture into any openings. If you don't have an alcohol-based cleaning solution at hand, you can also use alcohol wipes. You should ensure the wipes have a relatively high concentration of alcohol. The best is 70% and above. This ensures that any viruses that are on your phone can be effectively killed. While you sanitize your phone, avoid using aerosol sprays, abrasives, and cleaners. And do not spray directly onto the phone screen or back. Bleach should also not be used to clean the phone as it may damage the surface. It is also best to wipe any relevant accessories used with your phone. Chargers, headsets, and phone cases should be sanitized at the same time you clean your device. They should also be removed from the device when cleaning. Now your phone and its friends are clean. To prevent putting your phone against your face or the likelihood of transferring germs or viruses, use Bluetooth, a virtual assistant or hands-free speaker system if you can. To properly carry out a hand rub, apply a palmful of the product in your cupped hand, covering all surfaces. Rub your hands palm to palm. Rub your right palm over the back of your left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub your hands palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked. Rotationally rub backwards and forwards the clasped fingers of your right hand in your left palm and vice versa. Once your hands are dry, they are now safe. For teenagers, it's a little harder in some ways and in other ways it's a little easier because they do understand the difference between right and wrong. It's clearer what are some of the things that they love and you can remove those things. But one of the things that's really important with teenagers is really to take the time to make sure that they understand that their feelings and their opinions are valued. So in the moment, yes, I'm removing these things, but I'm also having a conversation with you about why you won't have access to these things for a particular period, right? We're explaining why this thing might be dangerous to you, whether or not you agree with it. I am the parent, right? This is where I am coming from. It really requires a conversation because ultimately what you want to teach them to do you know, is to reason and to think, right? You don't want to just be disciplining and you're not helping them to think through it and to use proper judgment and reasoning skills. And so those are some of the things that you can try. If the child becomes stubborn, the child is more obstinate and the child has a fixed mindset, if you will, that this is what he or she is going to continue to do, then you might need professional help. You might need to call the commission or you might need to call a social worker or a guidance counselor to help for you because sometimes parents don't have the language either to even explain why this behavior is wrong. And that causes friction. Once the friction starts, then we recommend that you get a third party involved because it could become worse. We've reached the last page of your favorite magazine program. Missed aspects of today's offering? Watch it at your leisure on our YouTube channel. We're also available on our website and all the major social media platforms. There's a free mobile app that can be downloaded from your smartphone's app store. On behalf of the entire team here at the GIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.